how we would pour to fall in love, oh, in love, in love. Come on, start with me, let's get some privacy, who's in control? I'm losing, feeling kind of reckless, and I don't want to mess this up, I'll mess it up. time on LinkedIn sessions. We're back here. It's a Tuesday for, a, for a, a bit of a change. It's been Friday for a while and now we're here on Tuesday and I am absolutely really chuffed bits to have Oye with me all the way from last week we had a guest from Vietnam and today you are in Qatar, right? That's right. <laughs> so before we get on with the chat, let me just welcome everybody in. We've got a couple of viewers already. These conversations by me, Fanny Stay, Certified Money Coach, are to, for the pure aim of opening the door to conversation about money. We are in tricky times financially. For some of us, it's going absolutely swimmingly. For others, we're having a really crap time. But something that's always been the elephant in the room is money and that's something that I want to try and change by talking about it. So I decided to have these sessions which I run at lunchtime and invite people to come along, um, both some who are involved with money, some who aren't, just to have a conversation. So we're not here to just answer a whole load of questions for you, although we will be totally delighted to see your comments and your questions in the chat box. I have my trusty assistant over there who is also monitoring the stream on Facebook. Um, so yeah, put anything you want to in the comments box. But we're just going to have a conversation about money. I've got some questions. Should we not find something to talk about? Although that's probably going to be difficult. We're just going to change. That's yeah. What's that noise in the background? What's that? Hmm, it's an interesting one. Anyway. Okay. So, welcome. Yes. Lovely Thank to you. you here. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah, so what time of day is it for you there? Uh, three coming up. Is it four o'clock now? Three hours okay. ahead. Okay, yeah. I'm about we're one o'clock here. So yeah. let me let me tell everybody how I came to um, came across you. I was actually working with a client who had um, a significant credit card debt, and I had to fess up in my job. I didn't really know it wasn't my area of expertise. And she said to me, and I'm hoping she might actually join today. And if you do, say hello. Um, and she actually came to me, she goes, oh, we've been looking at Oye's YouTube channel. So I headed over to your YouTube channel, of which the link is below for anybody who wants to find you. And I have to say, you really have got some amazing content on debt, amongst other things. But if we focus, just think about debt for a moment, how did you, how did you get into all that kind of subject matter? Why did that come to you? Well, it started quite quite a few years ago, um, around, I think about 2000, before 2007, 2006. Basically, I, I kind of took, a, I had to take time out from life and just to try and understand different areas of life of how it works. And one of the areas that I saw that was a bit of a problem for people was money and debt, okay? So basically, 
what happened is I met a friend and we had discussions about it. And we started to really try and break down and understand the, the whole process of how a person gets into debt. And the, basically the, the debt collectors mainly, that was what really spearheaded it, but it's really how they ended up in debt. And I guess I was just unhappy with the way how the whole process of someone being in debt, how, how it made them, how it changed their life, how it really affected their lives negatively. And I realized that it didn't need to do that. So I needed to understand exactly how the process of the whole debt industry works. So for me, when I, when I, wanna, when I wanna look at an area, I need to know full details. So I started educating myself. So like understanding how they are, how the debt collectors and creditors are governed, what rules they follow, et cetera. So that opened up a whole plethora of information for me. So what I realized is the way that the information is put out there, it's really quite complicated. So it's not simple, plain English. So I sat there and I thought to myself, I started helping my friends and people around me and I started changing the, well, literally changing their situations in terms of their debt, their debt situation. And I ended up writing up quite a lot of debt for people or helping them to. Now, I started getting a lot of people contacting me, loads and loads of people contacting me. And it started to really affect me. It used to like really, I felt for these people. So I sat there as I started going through the journey of looking at debt and trying to decide and understanding the whole situation. I thought to myself, I need more people to understand it. And the best way for them to understand it is to break it down into the, the most simplest form, plain English, so any person can understand it. And I know the information out there is not designed for the normal consumer to understand, but I'll fix that. I decided to fix that issue. So that's how I really got into it. So my, my goal is to change. It's, my, it's kind of my thing to change the world for the better in terms of this situation. So anyone's life I can change in terms of debt, I will do whatever I can, and it makes it's it's better than it's better than whatever I used to do before in terms of work and business. It's more fulfilling, so that's why that's how I got into it. And it needed something to fulfil me. Have you ever been in debt? Oh yeah, I have, but I've known how to manage it. Yeah, right. I have been in debt before. So, so I was. It wasn't, in... it wasn't that because you because so I see a lot of money coaches and people who yeah. are my peers, etc., who come to you know come to help helping people you know I, oh i was in twenty five thousand pounds of the debt and because i've got out it i can now help you and i was just wondering when you started in 2007 were you in debt then when i start i was i was in debt before i uh, so what i did is but my debt was i was high income earner so i was in debt for no reason and i'll tell you why i was in debt i was in debt purely because of the fact that I was just frivolous. I was buying and um, spending thousands on Mercedes convertible and nonsense on partying and this. So for me, my debt for me wasn't justifiable. So I just, I sat there and I looked at how easy it was for me to get myself into debt, despite the fact that I was a high earner. So for me, my, my case wasn't the case that I was in debt and I was like on my knees. It was a case that I was in debt for an unexplained reason. And that was an area that really that I had to look at because I also noticed that a lot of people in terms of I had the people who were really struggling as in they were not eating okay in order to pay their debts but I had another uh, another area of people who basically you would never think they're in debt they will be the ones driving a brand new Jag or brand new Bentley you'd never think they're in debt and that I would see their debt level and I started to realize that it's not just the, it's it's just the way the whole narrative it's almost like the the whole the way society is it's very about consuming and putting your in the debt finding an avenue to to spend that money and the banks are the ones who sit there and go we we just need an excuse to lend you money yeah. you see um, and you know i mean obviously as a money coach i'm dealing with people and their money and unresolved money issues which i think all of us have some have unresolved money issues to a certain extent but mm. it, it, it is absolutely fascinating the number of people that i that um, i come across um who are earning really well but have a large amount of debt that just just sits there like a noose around their neck but because it's okay and they can meet the minimum minimum payment maybe a bit more it just 
carries on and carries on and carries on. I just, you know, thinking just how draining that is. But actually, because they're looking for the next shiny toy, which has its all of its own emotional things behind it, behind it anyway, they're just opening the bank statements and the credit card statements and going, well, it's it's okay. It's not, you know, it's not too bad. And though the people that are, have debt on that level are really, really interest me, really interest me. And obviously the people that get into, into um, a situation through low earnings, etc. One thing I wanted to say, which oh, just completely riles me now. And you know mm. when they're advertising for all these products and you can take out the debt and then it goes, terms of condition, and they have that bit at the end of it. Nobody ever. Should they be allowed to speed that up? I don't know. Should they have to write that in plain English? Should they get Oye to write that bit, I think? <laughs> It'll be a good idea. And to so what honest, was your first video? Oh, God. There you go. The, There's a question. That wasn't <laughs> that's right. a question. Uh, the first ever video I did on my channel, I think was probably... Um, I probably did a few videos at once. So one of the first videos was I did about the Middle East, and I also did, I, I did, I just did about Middle East, and then I did, I kind of went straight in hard on the whole debt thing, and I took on, the, on like the first major video I did was basically teaching people how they can write off their debt, credit cards, loans, etc. That's the first major video that I would say, um, and that video, the videos that I do around debt are quite. How can I put it? They're quite emotional, purely because of the fact that I probably have an experience of someone around me that kind of fuels it. And I think when I did the How to Write Off Debt video, I, at the time, I was helping someone who, who basically was a retired woman, she's quite an old woman, and who kindly helped someone with, with um, a loan, yeah. but they didn't pay her back the loan. But what happened is the debt collector solicitor managed to convince her which is against the fca rules right now to part with her savings which she saved her life savings to clear partial part of the debt but included a heavy amount of interest on top so for me that i cannot tell you how much that fueled my anger there and i thought i'm going to show these people how it works okay so that's why i created that that's the first major video that i did and that video is the one that I think has helped most people. Okay. So the question then that comes to my mind is how, how let's just say credit cards are never gonna go away. How yeah. credit cards work well? Oh, basically, you know what it is? The best way to talk about this is to understand money and where it comes from. And credit is just a facility. Once you start to understand credit is a facility, then you have to sit there and understand things like leverage, leveraging. So the way a credit card is gonna work well for you is if it builds up your credit in order to use leverage to invest in something that makes you money. So that's how I have a credit card. I, would ne I don't ever have credit card debt. I don't, simple as that. But I will utilize it because I'll use it and I'll, I'll pay off everything on my credit card even before I have a bill. Purely yeah. because of the fact that I'm trying to increase, I increase my credit rating in order to give me a higher borrowing power. What people don't understand really, and a lot of people don't, is that borrowing power is everything, not how much money you have. If you've got borrowing power of 10 million, you can pretty much do anything you want. All the Richard Branson and this, it's their borrowing power that makes them so powerful. Do you see? So for I me, yeah, when you're utilizing the credit card, the credit card has to be used in a sensible way i.e. To, to build up your credit or you can take advantage of something on the credit card. It's not to be used for you to get into debt. So you don't, you don't use it, if you, have a, if you have an income of a thousand pounds, then the maximum you can, and you're spending as a thousand pounds a month, then the maximum you should be using on a credit card is a thousand because that's what you spend. What you don't wanna do is fall into the trap which you're supposed to fall into, which is to spend more than what you have because you're not, it's not money that you've got, it's not free money. No. And that's what I try to teach a lot of people. So if the credit card companies were to go, okay, we realize what we're doing is wrong, 
Right, I know that's never going to happen, right? But mm. we're just we're just dreaming here. If the credit card card companies were to get reasonable, is there an interest rate or a deal that they could offer people that we think would be fair? Because I think the big thing about it now is is that you know once you're hooked and you're not you, you're not playing the game, i.e., you're not playing the game for you, you're playing the game for them, and you're paying minimum payment or you're doing whatever because it's not well explained. How can we, if we were to switch that over and actually say to the credit card companies, right, what we want of you is to provide a service that does this. Is that, does that exist, you think? No, there, well, the way it works is if you don't make your, if you don't make the full payment, then you, you, yeah. you pay interest. So that's the way the process. So because there's a financial benefit for um, the creditor, i.e. the bank, they, they, what they want. Let me explain to you in a simple way. Their job is to keep a customer in debt for as long as possible because it means they they are retained as a customer and they'll keep paying. So what? That's why you get teenagers being offered credit cards and loans at a very young age because they are easy pickings because yeah. they they haven't understood about money. And that's why I I I I've spoken I've spoken about this before that. I don't think anyone should be should have any borrowing that is not in terms of something beneficial like a mortgage until at least the age of 28 because give them the amount of time to understand about credit and money so in terms of a fair it's not really a case of the, the interest rate it's the fact that no matter what interest rate they put it keeps that person in there so they're always going to be paying money they so because if they if they can't clear their credit if they spend more than what they have they are going to be paying it I think the figures are, if you, I looked on, um, it was on Money Saving Expert and the figures that I've, I've used before is that if you were to have a £3,000 credit card debt and you simply paid the minimum payment every month and you're working on an interest rate of about 17.9%, I think it's about 26 years and nine months to pay off. There we go. You have, you have someone paying you for, imagine you have a contract with someone paying you guaranteed for 26 years. Yeah. <laughs> And yet, and yet if you raise the if you raise the um your payment and i think it, it would be set it around 70 odd quid or something per month if yeah. you raise it to say 100 and literally paid 100 off every month it would take something like five years to pay off there we go That's Crazy. The thing. yes and and the, the thing is that person never needed to get to that position in the first place because they should have been educated about the fact re, people need to be educated exactly what a credit card is. It's money that you is not yours. So, so anything you're spending is not yours. Who needs to change the credit card company or the consumer? The credit card company aren't going to change. The consumer needs to educate themselves. So basically, this is why I create like no one is. Do you know what? No one gives you handouts in life. When someone has a conflict of interest, when the when the credit card company financially benefits from you being in debt, then they're not going to teach you. It's not it's not their job to teach you. So your job is to understand what you haven't been taught, which is to understand what it means to be what a credit card means. What it means, like do you know the nasty side of it? What it can mean long term? Do you know like the information that you just given? When you start to someone, you, you know you know what I, I would say to someone, right? Do you know when they want to go and buy a, a car for 60,000, like 60,000, 70,000? I would say to them, work and save up 70,000, physically take that cash and watch yourself pass over that for that piece of tin and see how you feel about it. Because all of this borrowing and lending, it doesn't seem anything purely because of the fact that it's kind of money that you're paying off in bits. So you don't really, it doesn't really seem so much to you. But when someone gets, for example, 30 or 40,000 pounds of debt, they don't even understand how. So the, the important thing is for the consumer to understand why they're spending their money, what the benefit is. You see, understand like what is an asset is and what a liability is. So they need to educate themselves in all these types of areas before they even think about borrowing any money yeah. or getting any credit facility. Yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah. So I want to talk about, I'll tell you what I want to talk about, because I don't yeah. think this talks about enough so you've gone and you've gone and got yourself into a loan of debt right and you're suddenly going oh my god i can't afford to pay this off what do we do so if you can't afford for me yes, if you're in a situation you can't 
I've got 10 grand on my credit card. Yeah. They're charging me at 19%. And I can't afford to make, I can't, I, I've been paying the minimum payments all year for ages. And I'm just not getting anywhere with it. Nothing's happening with it. I'm not using the card and I'm fed up with it. What can I do? First thing is don't even panic. It's unsecured debt. That's the first thing. I wouldn't care if I had half a million of unsecured debt. The first, that's the first thing you don't need is it's your, your family and your well-being is the number one and most important thing. And the second thing is don't sit there and just leave it and don't sit there and just assume the problem will solve itself by you doing nothing. This is where you have to educate yourself because there is a system in place and a system has to be in place because there are too many people who get into debt. So what you need to do is understand what happens when you get into debt. Like, so if I, if, sorry, if, if you are unable to pay your debt. So when you understand that, you, you sit there and like I do, I go for the FCA um, uh, debt collection guidelines. I understand what the process is, what the creditor has to do, what, what, the, um, what they can and can't do. So the first thing is you, the first thing in any problem that anyone has in life is you need to find out the solutions. People panic and get worried because people don't get panic if they don't, if they know the solution. They panic because they don't know the solution. So when you don't understand how to, the, the end result, or for example, what is the worst possible scenario or how I can get out of it, that's when people panic and they get stressed or whatever. So the first thing is to take understand that you understand the worst possible scenario if you can't pay this, pay this um, credit card bill. And secondly, find out what your options are in order, in order to solve it. That's the thing. That's what I always tell people to do. Yeah, and understand that. I think that I, I get that. But I think sometimes what happens to people is that they're fearful of stepping in the wrong direction. So, for instance, you know, uh, getting caught out. So for instance, so, you know, I know that there are, I've watched a few videos and it's like, okay, it's not doing, it's not paying it and you negotiate a one pound per month, etc. But I also know people who phoned up and they've gone, well, what can you afford to pay? And they sort of then kept it, kept it moving forward. And so there is sort of like a set of guidelines or a set of rules that you need to follow in order to do that. And I think that there are some people out there, many people out there that are fearful to do that. And I, I know it's about putting your mission hat on and your warrior, which are the money types that I use in my coaching, but not everybody comes from that place. It is difficult, isn't it? It's so, honestly, it's so easy. I speak to people, I ask them, what are you scared? What are you scared of? And then when I ask them what they're scared of, they have to think about what they're scared of. And they'll start, some people say to me, yeah, but what if bailiffs come to come to my and, and I say, well, who told you a bailiff is going to come to your house based on your credit card debt? What what has made you think that? Because you know what, when people are in a state of stress or panic, they create things that don't exist. They create scenarios that do not exist. Well, what so do they me, say? They fear false expectations appearing real, right? Exactly. So what I say to them is, I'll say, write down what you are fearful of. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you think a bailiff is going to come to your house, right? Find out what find out what the, the rules as to what you can do to prevent it, number one. Or number two, find out how realistic this is, because you'll find that it's not. And you know, even you just have to think logically in certain things. So we have to understand the process of a bailiff to come out. So it means that you've not communicated with a credit card company, you've ignored them, they've written to you, it's been months and months and months. The credit card company, for example, the bank, let's say Barclays, it's very unlikely they'll even take you down the legal route. So it has to be sent to a debt collector, sold to a debt collector. They have got to go through uh, a whole routine and they have to sit there and ignore. Then they have to go through to court. Then there has to be uh, the, the court process. Then after the court process, they have to sit there and decide whether a bailiff is going to come to the door of someone who they have no idea has anything. So what, that's why I, go, I always go for the process of a person's fee. Yeah. So I sit and go, if that's what you're fearing, let's go for the process. I'll talk, even yourself, talk through the process. Go on Google and go, what is the process of me having a bailiff to my door? Yeah. yeah. That's what I mean, people don't confront the actual, when they, they just think, right, bailiff, but they're not going to sit there and go through, how realistic is it? And As people will watch right? those television shows, won't they? What's that show when the bailiffs oh, go? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, they won't pay. <laughs> Do you know the beauty of that show, right, is the fact that 
it creates the narrative. What they don't tell you about forcing entry is there are certain rules that, that will allow a bailiff to first force entry. And let me tell you, it is usually when it comes to criminal government. On a, on a private matter, they have to get special permission to that, which is unlikely granted. So the percentage on the private matter is tiny. Even for a, a government a government matter, they don't like to sit there forcing um, forcing um, entry into people's houses. But that program isn't going to tell you that. What they will do is show you that, create the narrative, and everyone thinks that's going to happen. Do you see my well, point? It's good telly, isn't it? Of course, they're not going to sit there. With the, <laughs> they're not going to sit there and show the paperwork side of it. Going well, I don't think we should go to this person's house. Do you see what I mean? Exactly. So we've got Dennis. Dennis, who's on the, who's joined us. Dennis is a fellow money coach of mine. He's great. Okay. Dennis Parkinson, and he said uh, right. credit, credit is not money; it's debt. Totally true. Credit card companies are not offering us money; they're offering us debt. When you understand that, you make much better choices about whether you want to use debt to buy things. One thing I want to go on to just for a second, because I know that and you, the videos that you've got on your YouTube channel are so clear and so easy to understand for everyone. So I just would urge people to have a look at them. The link obviously is right there. But let's just touch on for a minute about the responsibility of debt. Mm. Because I think it's all very, it's easy for us to sort of talk about, well, we can just run up the debt and we can write it off and we can write it off. When does the, when does the sympathy flip over to the consumer who has actually obviously run up debt in the first place for you? Okay. There were two, there's, the way I look at debt is in two type, in two ways, right? If, for example, someone's created uh, run up debt with someone who's physically, like lending them money in terms what Dennis has said is right that you actually create a credit facility is created you you don't you're not bought, lend money it's a credit facility yeah so if someone if I lend you ten thousand pounds there's a responsibility for me I don't sit there anyone for me I don't I will never be on someone's side who someone's physically lent money in in that uh, uh, let them uh, ten thousand pounds for example and they're yeah. not paying them but the responsibility, when you're trying to flip it across to the consumer, the, the responsibility starts with the person lending money. Like, realistically, what it, how, why, how can you give a 16-year-old 5,000 pounds? Yeah, no. Or a 16-year-old 5,000 pounds? There's a lack of responsibility there. So when you're, t so the responsibility has to start with the lender because they, the, most of the money that's lent to people, people can't afford it. They don't lend money to people who can afford it. So. As, like I said, a kid, I have 18 year olds who in 10, 20,000 pounds worth of debt and haven't been working for the, they've not even been working for the period of uh, not even a year. So for me, it's a difficult one for me to sit there and go, the consumer, the, 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 the only way I, I can talk about the consumer taking responsibility is to educate yourself. So if you've not educated yourself about it, then you, you're in that position you have to take that part of your responsibility because you have to uh, educate yourself. And if you're spending it frivolously or nonsense, then there is, there's areas in your life that you need to look at, which is much deeper than the fact of the debt. The debt is easy to deal with. It's what has caused you to be in that position. And that's key to me, more than the debt itself. My nephew, my nephew, when he was 18 years old, he was he went to Lloyd's Bank, naming you Lloyd's, he went to the bank and lent him um, eighteen thousand pounds by a monster truck. You see. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So how was he able to get eighteen thousand pounds like well, that? He had, a, he had a salary of twenty-three. So he has a he has a twenty-three thousand pound a year salary and he's lent eighteen thousand. How yeah. realistic? How realistic is this guy going to live a year? Yeah, without understanding his circumstance, with eighteen thousand. That his his is his isn't the worst. I've had people borrow more than they're earning. <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah. They're borrowing with more than they're earning. Yeah. So that's the flip side of it. It's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy. It's, it is absolutely crazy. So look, let, we've done. We've talked a bit about debt. And I think that it's important for people. I think the message that I'd like to I'd like to have people go out there with today is that if you are sitting there with a large debt, um, personal debt or credit card debt, the first thing is don't panic. 
watch your videos and actually we can you know it can be worked through it can be worked through in a way in a way to help you um my issue from a money coach is that is obviously not hopefully that money is made available to somebody but i've also got to ask myself and ask that person why did you take it you know because it's taking stuff that you, that you can't really afford there's all sorts of stuff we're such weird creatures when it comes to money aren't we <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, so let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to change the subject now. Yeah. What did you learn about money from your parents? What did I learn? Well, I learned basically you just have to work and get money. And money, that's all I learned. So get a job and earn money. So that's really the narrative that I that I got from my parents. Like study hard, get a job, earn money and then your life will be better, sort of thing. So you started in IT, right? Was it IT? Yes, that's it, IT sales. Good money in IT sales back then, eh? It definitely was. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't really enjoy it? Um, no, well, it's, for me, it doesn't, it's, it didn't fulfill me. No. So it, all, it, all I did was earn money. Fortunately, I invested in things as well. Even though I was wasting money on nonsense, I still invested in stuff. But I didn't get any fulfillment. I felt I'm just part of a normal corporate world where people are going nine to, nine to five. And for me, as a natural human, this isn't normal. This life isn't normal. Like our bodies don't. This is not what we're naturally here to do. To sit there and work nine to five in societal created <laughs> things yeah. just my point no okay so uh, so your parents taught you to just basically go out and get a job did you, did you do the university route no i didn't i left before that came out and went and did yeah. that okay so you brought you've come out have you ever struggled to make ends meet i actually haven't <laughs> fortunately I, I never have i i'm resourceful <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it, that, that um, I see, I notice from my particular point of view, I notice that there are some people who find earning money really, really easy. Like, it's just like, I just don't really understand. You just go out and you make money. Whereas I find there's another batch of people that actually find it quite difficult, that there's a, there's a whole thing. And to a certain extent with me, I've never really been a big earner in my in my life i've been a great investor and a great yeah. saver and you know and done made some wise decisions in my life to end up in the situation that we're in now and i've also had the beauty of having been able to have been working from home for the last 20 years you know i've been self-employed yeah. for the last 20 years which i know a lot of people would would love to have to be at home with yeah. kids and that kind of stuff but it but i've never been you know had big fat salaries and all that kind of stuff do you think there's something in somebody's makeup that makes it easier? How do you think people get that vibe? Mm, um, it's a tricky one purely because of the fact that, how can I put it? I guess, I guess people, I'll tell you how I look at money. Money just can be created out of thin air just by typing digits. So for me, it is something that is always going to be accessible in, in some way. Some, I find that some people, like, if they're struggling with money, they, they kind of allow the problem to be a problem. Do you see what I mean? So they allow it to just continue to be a problem. So if they're struggling with money, they won't, they will rather focus on the struggling with money rather than sit there and think there are so many other ways of making money and solutionize. Do you see my point? So for yeah. example, I would, I would, if, I didn't have an income stream. I would find, I would look at what there is because there's always something, there's always some way of making money. And mm -hmm. it, depends, it depends on what you want to do. Like for me, if I, if I had no idea, I would do whatever is required. For me, my, my mom actually taught me something. She said, whatever you do in life, any job that you do, yeah, you'll learn something from it. Even if you go and work in a bar, you'll learn stuff from it. So for example, you start somewhere People, some people don't like to start again and start from the, from the bottom. I mean, if you start somewhere, uh, start again, you build yourself back up. And also, a lot of people who find it difficult to, difficult to make money, it's not a case of it's not that they can't make the money. 
is they just believe they need a certain amount of money. So they restrict whatever they're going to do based on what they require rather than cutting back or changing their habits as a point. When you change your habits to, when you adjust both sides, which is your spend and also your income, then it allows you to change what you do in order to make money. Do you, do, does that make sense to you? It makes complete sense to me. And actually, that to me really rings home because I remember I, I was telling you just before we came on, like, online that I lived in Australia for a year. Yeah. And I was, lucky, I was lucky enough, I earned good money out there, which I never really expected to do. And I ended up going on a three month road trip with a bum bag full of dollars, right? And it was, it was great. And the way I worked it out was, I was going, right, I'm not gonna be working anymore. That, uh, that's it now, my working time is over here. And I have a set date for when I actually go back uh, off to, to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So I basically took that amount of money and divided it by the number of days that I had. So, and then I always spend under that. So actually, there you go, you see. So, so if I had, you know, if I had a hundred dollars to spend in that day, I'd spend 85, let's say. Yeah. So it would, so the number, the amount of money that I had to spend every day got bigger. Yeah. And it, and that really works. And I think sometimes the simplicity of just doing something like that, but, you know, it's about paying attention to your finances, right? Because nobody's going to care about them more than you are. But it's sometimes for people, it's really difficult for them to pay attention to their finances because they just don't want to. They don't feel they can. They've got this silly belief that they're rubbish with money. And, and you know, money slips through my fingers and all that kind of stuff. But you're right. You're absolutely right that... Um, it is really as simple as that and it's about grounding ourselves around money isn't it really just centering correct. ourselves correct you know? yeah. that's so can be up here can't it whether you're buying whether you're in debt it's like oh loads of things i can have it i can't afford it you know the energy is way up here we want to bring it down and center it into our bodies so that we can actually it sounds a bit like woo woo but it, it is to a certain extent but it's just about stabilizing ourselves yes exactly right i'm going to ask you another question now yes this list, okay we <laughs> yes i've got it ready pick one okay so no i'm going to do what was your biggest money mistake um mistake i for me i think mistakes are things you can learn from but i think when i was really when i was um quite young I must have spent ten thousand pounds on a franchise that was basically I got duped into it and it didn't work out. But for me, I would never I never dwell on it as a mistake because all I slept, all I thought to myself is next year I'll make that back up. And so I may double that just to cover that as a separate. So for me, that was I'd say that was my biggest um lot mistake loss or whatever yeah i'd say okay so moving on then from that just moving on from that smoothly is there and i'm not asking what the figure is but yeah. is there a point where you say i've got enough how can i put it um i i don't it's a good question because for me i think you have enough when your life means you can do whatever you want so for me i can do whatever i want and um, when i want and because i invest in things that create money so in a nutshell i guess the point for me when when you have enough is when you don't need to work in or doing things is a choice right that's, that's when you have enough but we all know what we see when we're looking at so many people, celebrities and you know, wealthy people, that when you that is reached, nothing stops. There's still business still to carries on. And I you know, I'm answering my own question here, but I'm just doing it, it's, it's putting it out there for you. That what keeps you going then? You can do what you want. So do you stop? Well, what keeps me going is I'm trying to I'm trying to do something that's positive for the world. So mine's not about money. Mine is about changing the world for the better. So that's where my direction is. 
And when you're talking about, for example, celebrity, if you're talking about celebrities or big business people, is it's quite it's interesting because you'll see very high earners who continue to work nine to five, or whatever, because they are programmed that way. So they will find a reason to spend money. And that's what I find interesting about people is they only need stuff. They they suddenly require stuff that they never required when they create when they've had they, when they get money for it. So, yeah. for example, the person earning ten thousand a year never required a Ferrari when they started earning before. But if they had a million, all of a sudden they need a Ferrari. They need this and they need that. So, for me, I find it I find human beings interesting in in that way, and I find that when the key to, the key is not really how much money you earn, it's how much you require to spend, yeah? You get my, my point, because if you earn 10 million and you need nine, nine, like 11 million, then you're still, no matter what, you're still, you've got a problem. So for me, I always, the, 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 the difficulty with, with human beings is the graph of spend and earn um, keeps going up in the same direction and spend a, can overtake a lot. Do you see and my we point? call that, what do we call that? We call that wage creep, right? Yes, exactly. Mm. So, and so for me, like, I just think when you're a person who's working, if you're, if you're earning good money and you're working every day, nine to five, there's a problem there. There really is a problem because yes. you shouldn't be. Like, yeah. there is, because there, how much, if you gave someone, let's say Jeff Bezos has 190 billion, he can never, ever, ever, ever spend 190 billion on himself. If he has a hundred bedroom house, he only has one, he can only be in one room. <laughs> he can only live in one at any one time. He has 50 cars, he can only drive one car at a time. So people don't require this. Do you see my point? Yeah. And isn't life so much more simple when we keep it simple? A hundred percent. You know, when I mean, I've got into these things now. So for me, I only ever wear, I've got a certain number of jumpers and a certain number of scarves. That's my uniform, right? Makes it so much easier when I wake up in the morning. I just pick a jumper and pick a scarf and hope it's not the same one that I wore last week. I know like a lot of blokes like um, yeah. that wear the same thing all the time, you know, like Simon Cowell and all those kind of people. They just wear the same thing. But it is, it's, it's really interesting how we sort of formulate these things, you know, how we work out these things. We lived in a house, a much bigger house than we're in now, but we needed to move for, for schools. Yeah. So we actually moved into a two and a half bed semi-detached house. It's in a very, very nice area, don't get me wrong, but it's a two and a half bed semi-detached house and there were four of us. And we thought, it's okay, we'll just move here for a while. This is from a five bed detached house, really nice garden and all this kind of stuff. Just move here for a while and then we'll go back there when we've got into the schools. I know it's naughty and you're not supposed to do that. However, we moved over here. We've been here. Well, this is our seventh year here now. And mm. actually, I know Ren doesn't agree with us because she would prefer to move back to the big house. I know that. But I know me and Neil, um, we feel much happier here. Yeah. And that's you know, the thing. We moved here and all of a sudden we were all cosy in the living room. We were in a, you know, a smaller living space. And actually, that suited us really well. Yeah. And yet it's interesting when before COVID, maybe clients would turn up and they'd sort of go, oh, my coach lives here. And there's all that judgment, etc. It's very interesting. It is interesting. And, you, and that's the thing. What you've just said is part of society. They judge based on what you have. If you want to look at if you want to look at one of the richest people in the world, like Warren Buffett, the guy is he has the same old car that he's had in the same three bedroom house. So yeah. you have to under the people who actually get to that level of money, they start to understand money. And also in terms of when people just keep going and earning money, there is a crossover. Um, when they start having, for example, they become billionaires or whatever, there is a crossover from it being earning money to ego. Do you see my point? So oh. therefore they want to be the richest person in the world or control people. It becomes a, a matter of they want control. They want control over other people, or they just, it's an egotistical thing. So, yeah, no, God, sorry, finish. So, they don't actually require the money. So, basically, 
Jeff Bezos example would want to be the richest person in the world. He doesn't know why. He just wants the title of the richest person in the world. He doesn't require the money, but it becomes that. It becomes I want I and it's a, it's all human nature that even the the greatest minds or greatest business people in the world they are still controlled by human nature. Do you see? Yeah. Because yeah. you see my point. Because he could have stopped a long time ago. Like <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that. So the money types that I that I work with, one of the money types is the tyrant. And the tyrant is all about never enough, never enough, never enough, always gonna have more. It's always about business, it's about being the richest, it's about having, you know, but about controlling people, manipulating people, and all that kind of stuff. But the thing is, the tyrant's biggest fear is a fear of abandonment, a fear of losing all their money and a fear of being alone. And thinking that that's what they can, that's what they can control. It's really, it, it is interesting. And you know, my money story took me through. You know, I had a lot of tyrant energy going on with me for a long time, where it was basically because my parents lost all, lost, gave all our money away, and I just thought I want to be wealthy. I don't want to have worry about anybody else having to provide for me. I want to do it all by myself, and that was fine. But I became sort of secretive and controlling and a bit manipulative with it and realized that, you know, when you get to a certain status that actually it doesn't make me happy. And that's not a nice, not a nice outlook on money. It's not a nice way to look at it. And you're right. And the reason the reason why money can't make you happy, it doesn't actually make a person fully happy is because um, people don't understand that happiness is something that's very short lived. It's only in bot. So every, when you, if you earned, if you just won the lottery today and make and had five million, that five million happiness isn't going to last you for the rest of your life because it's done. It's ha the the reason why, <laughs> like, um, as 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 natural beings, the reason why happiness is like enjoyment is is not literally short lived is for the for the protection for the um, protection of our actual species so for example if we were if you're with a man or woman once and that's you you're done then the species will die out just see my point so yeah. we require uh, we we require lots and lots of different continuous different um things that make us happy or give us enjoyment over the period of our lives so like like we, like you just mentioned about like um sorry when when you when you had you felt happy when you were in a in a certain place um it was it, it's never it wasn't going to last it wasn't going to last for you purely big, it wasn't going to last totally like i said the reason just the reason that i said well it was just and also just just because it was bigger and it was nicer it doesn't make it better it was the whole energy of this house that we're in now which was so much nicer and when you're talking about the happiness thing you're so right it's like look look at amazon people get onto Amazon, order something, get excited about it arriving. There's nothing bad about opening a cardboard box that arrives on the front doorstep, right? But that moment of happiness lasts how long? There's only one possession that I have that still brings me as much happiness as the day that I got it. And I look at it every day, and that's my engagement ring, because I just love looking at the sparkly diamond. <laughs> <laughs> I like <laughs> So look, I'm looking at the time, and we're already 10, 10 to 10 to. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question, which is, what advice? No, no, no. I'm not going to ask you that one. I'm not going to ask you that one. I'm going to say, uh -huh. um, how best can people improve their financial literacy? We've got your YouTube channel, mm -hmm. but what else would you advise people to do? I would say, um, go back to basics, like unlearn whatever you've been taught about money, as in through a system, and by the people who are giving, who are putting you in a situation where it might be the situation might be difficult, and go back to basics. Start with understand money, how it appears, and. So once you start understanding from the basics, then you can start to, when you're earning money, you'll appreciate what it can do for you. Let me give you an example. I see money as workers for me. They're employed to work for me. So basically, oh if I don't, yeah, my money needs to be doing something for me because I'm not here to work. The money's there to work for me. 
So if I invest into certain things, if I invest into a property and it's being rented, I check on my workers. They're doing just like a business. You see what your workers are doing. If I invest in a stock market, I know the business I've invested in, they are working for me. So you have to look at money as your employees. So if you're a person who stashes money and does nothing with it, then your workers are sitting idle, twiddling their thumbs. Simple as that. Do you know, that's really interesting because um, one of the things that I've always said is that money, pound coins are like little foot soldiers. Yeah. That are there to, like, you can build them up like into little armies and to protect you. But isn't yeah. it interesting that you're looking at yours as workers and I'm looking at mine as protection. Now I can see where my protection thing has come from, from my, from my background and from yeah. actually losing all our money overnight. Yeah. But I also see from yours how it's workers. You see, there you go. Difference in psychology. Correct. Because you have, to, when, you have to look at money as physically. So when you look at your bank account, it's just digits. Those digits are just sitting there. Money is worth nothing unless it's converted into something else. Yeah. So if you had if you had a hundred million pounds sit in your bank account, it doesn't do anything until you've exchanged it for something else. So for me, I don't, I hate, this is gonna sound strange, but I hate seeing money sitting in my account. I want it to be doing something. So I move it to something that, I give it a job. So that way I'm not working. I don't want, I don't think I should be working for something that can be made so easily. Yeah. It, you, you, instead of it controlling you, you should be controlling it. Because if you're working every day for it, it's control something like that is controlling your life. Yeah. And like, for example, I'll give you a quick example. Some people go and get a car finance, let's say a brand new BM, right? And they will, that BMW that they're spending, say a thousand or 700 pounds a month on, that BMW takes them to work, to, to earn money, to pay for the thing that's taking them to work. So I think it's the most ludicrous thing that I could ever imagine. Do you see? So it's, it's just it's so counterproductive so and for it, me it's yeah. like the guys it's like the guys who buy a really really lovely big house and then leave for work at six in the morning get yeah. home at, six o'clock at night and have an hour it, or so and then start thinking about going to bed it's the most lewd it's so counterproductive so many intelligent people are not intelligent in that area do you see because they it's almost they overcomplicate their life that's why i say go back to basics start to understand what money is and what it should be doing for you and look at money as your employee your worker check on it look at it look, look in your bank account what are you doing for me because <laughs> i'm still working so what are you doing you see right i'm not here to work you're here to work yeah no, that's really, really good advice. Oh, yeah, look, it's been fantastic having you with me today. Um, I know that I'm, I'll, I shall be continuing to watch your videos and learning stuff from you as well, which is great. And uh, I would urge everybody who watches this to go and have a look at Oye's YouTube, YouTube channel. And um, for those of you listening, it's www.youtube.com forward slash OYE, which is Oye TV Channel Global. All one word, OYE TV Channel Global. So go and take a look. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you and, for having me. Uh, maybe we'll get you back again at another point to talk about another subject. How about that? Sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot, OYE. Take care. Take care. Bye.